Welcome everybody uh, back here to the Siegel Theater Center. And we are still thrilled to see live audiences. I know the world has moved on and it's an mm -hmm. old hat, but we only opened basically in June. The Graduate Center was closed and we had to rebuild. So it's a great pleasure every evening for us to have um, um, with us um, a live audience, especially if it's uh, about an artist uh, and uh, such great one as we are celebrating today. Uh, Coltes, Bernard-Marie Coltes, a fantastic European playwright, a French playwright, many say the most significant one towards the end of the 20th century in France, and that does uh, say a lot. So we are honored uh, to uh, present some of his work. We actually published a book, uh, The Seven Plays in New American Translation, not British, but American translations. And I mean, uh, Afani, our great colleague here also at the Graduate Center and uh, in the CUNY system at Lehman College, uh, spearheaded it, we collaborated it, and so we are the publisher, and we also think about maybe there's a way to do these plays which we feel are so significant and actually grew. There's some work of artists that grows, like um, Simone, um, Mina Simone's work, you know, people say. Uh, all of a sudden it gets bigger, it gets more important, and nobody knows um, uh, why. And um, um, he had Sola's music, you know, he said, listen to it even a bit more, even though he was known, but right now we also feel um, he had something to say, he had a very strong connection to New York City, we will learn about it more, so welcome everybody for taking time, we also welcome our viewers on HowlRound, the evening is live streamed on HowlRound TV, a national non-profit theater platform that uh, has supported us for a very long time and we are uh, thrilled, so this also has a slightly larger audience than here in the room, and actually through this, it's also a global um, audience. We have great people here, the French Cultural Services, uh, Diane, Louise, uh, Nicole, we have Marion Cheval, Jonah Bocard, Dan Rothenberg, so, uh, and uh, many other colleagues, Thomas and, uh, and Claudia and, um, and um, Christina, so, so many here, so really thank you for coming and uh, celebrating um, this work for us. Now we're going to start so if you have a cell phone, you also take it out and make sure that is. I'll do the same. It never really rings at the Siegel Center at any event, so it's really true. So this would be good. If it continues, the structure of the evening will be, we will see two short excerpts, but also not too short, of two plays. Um, Amin will tell a little bit more about them. And then we will sit together and talk with the translator, the artist, and whoever them want to join in, why why should we listen to uh, Coltes? Why is he important? And um, and um, and perhaps also hear your reaction to it. So now I would like to introduce a great colleague of mine, great professor of theater. I mean, come over here. I can give you my phone. And um, he worked uh, many many years to put this together. I think Marion also translated one of the plays in the collection. He translated this really big, significant ones, the ones we're also going to hear tonight and he put the anthology together. So we worked on it for some while. So it's a great evening. We did a small presentation of it in Corona time, also as the French Cultural Services. It was our first event after two years. I thought it was a beautiful one, but um, we are now happy to do the book celebration in our center. So, I mean, tell us a little Thank bit. What point. are the plays about? What are we going to see? So the first play, uh, welcome everybody. The first play um, is a seminal monologue that um, Coltes wrote in 1977. It's a one sentence, 60 page monologue. Yes, that's what it is. Um, it's, uh, about, it's about a man that's, you know, we see often, especially in New York City. It's a very New York play, as is the second one. It's about a man who comes in the street and accosts you and asks you for money, for a cigarette, for a light, for a room for the night, for a beer, and ultimately for love. And um, it's a very powerful monologue. It changed quite, it changed theater, honestly. And people after this text wrote differently, tried to match that text. And uh, we are very honored to have Ismail Ip Connor, who is a master of Cortez and who is going to give us the night just before the forest. Ismail.
down there at the church in the morning. All the time the kids are getting sick and they dry off. They don't eat. They pack up their mom. They look behind their back. And I do help them eat. Just enough time to put the foot in my dead cold. I'll stay like this until I find a room.
understand this question of trial. Do I like to stand? Who could understand not a word they said? This is easy for me. I'm not completely from here. I'm sure he's noticed this. So French Brick with no imagination got it right. And despite all this, I ran after you the moment I saw you turn the street corner. Despite all the crisps left in the street and the cafes and the basements of the cafes, here, everywhere, despite the rain and the wet clothes, I ran. Not only for the rain, not only for that part of the night that I need a room, but I ran, ran, ran. Because at this time, turning the corner. Let me tell you. Maybe I'm the one who approached you. I'm the one who even looked in tonight. No, brother, I didn't say I did. I'm the one who asked for you to give me a light. But the one who approached us not always could be one. And I saw right away from there that you didn't look very strong, walking around all wet, not very tough at all. While me, despite all this, I'm resourceful. And me, I recognize those who aren't very strong with one quick glance because of their gait, especially just the way that they walk with those tiny steps, nervous like you, with their back nervous, and the way that they move their shoulders nervous, and something in their gait that doesn't fool me, with their face too made of little lines, not beat up or anything, but nervous, like you, something on the face that doesn't fool me, almost nothing, even when they walk around all swaggy, like pimps do, but pimps made of nerves, little pumps who spread out, but who come straight from their mothers, and 
and the whole top like this, all swaggering like nothing's going on under the rain, but me, I see right away this kind of nervousness, the kind that nobody can hide, because all that nervousness, it comes from the mother, straight out, and their mother, those little punks, they can't hide her away, no matter what they do. Me, instead, I'm like a slug, hulk made of bone, muscle. And all that comes from the father. Nerves have never bothered me because my father is the opposite. He was the tough type. The type that never got his nerves tangled up because of thinking too much. Nothing disturbed him. A man made of bone, muscle, a man of blood. People could have called him the Terminator. And me too. They could call me the Terminator. And that really is why politics and the party and the union that exists today and the cops and the army, which are all political, they're not what I want. All that is way too tangled up because of their head. And with their head, they throw you back to the factory. And me, the factory, never. Where is his microphone? Huh? Where is his microphone? Forgive me. Thank you. And thank you, Ms. Mao. Um, the second piece, I just wanted to, before I go to the second piece, I wanted to uh, introduce also the stage director, Philippe Boulet, who came straight from Paris. And who knows, uh, Coltes, who knows Coltes from a very long time ago, and his career has been very much defined by Coltes. Um, the second piece with Ismail Ibn Connor and the legendary Tony Torn. Yes, indeed. It's called, uh, it is, is honestly, um, I am not exaggerating at all, is probably the most important play, French play, of the second part of the 20th century. It's called In the Solitude of Cotton Fields. Um, like the piece you heard before, this one also changed theater. This one guy did it twice. Um, it's about a, an encounter that is not very dissimilar from the night just before the forest. Is a client walking in the street at night and meeting a dealer who stops him in his path. And the dealer tries to peddle sell something to the client without ever telling what that product is. And the client who says, hey, I'm not here to buy anything, is still very much there to get something. And the genius of this piece really is one of the most poetic pieces written for theater. But the genius of this piece is not just in what it says, but it's really also about what it doesn't say. And that absence of meaning really kind of makes a very special relationship between these two characters. So if you can please welcome Tony Torn, Ismail, thank you again. If you walk outside at this hour and in this place, it is because you desire something you do not have. And that thing, me, I can provide it to you. And if I have been in this place long before you and will be here long after you, and even at this hour when savage encounters between man and animals won't drive me away, it is because I have what is necessary to satisfy the desire that passes in front of me. And it is like a burden I must unload on whoever passes in front of me, man or animal. That is why I approach you. Despite the hour when ordinarily men and animals savagely pounce on each other, I approach you with open hands my palms turn towards you with the humility of someone who offers faces someone who buys, with the humility of someone who possesses facing someone who desires. And I see your desire 
like a light that turns on at the window at the very top of a building in a twilight. I approach you like that twilight approaches the first light. Slowly, respectfully, almost affectionately. Leaving down in the street the animals and the men who pull on their leashes and savagely show their teeth to one another. Not that I have guessed your desire, nor am I in a hurry to know. Because a customer's desire is the most melancholy thing, which you covet like a little secret waiting to be pierced, and you take your time to pierce it. Like a gift wrapped up whose string you take the time to untie. But then, ever since I've come to this place, all I have desired, all the things that all the men and all the animals might desire at this hour of darkness, which pulled them out of their homes despite the savage growls of, of unsatisfied animals and unsatisfied men. That's why I know better than the worried customer who for a time keeps his mystery to himself. Like a little virgin raised to be a whore. That what you will ask for I already have it, and that all you have to do without taking offense at the apparent injustice of being the one who asks, facing the one who offers. Since there is no real injustice on this earth, other than the injustice of the earth itself, sterile from the cold or sterile from the heat and rarely fertile from the mild mix of the heat and the cold. There is no injustice for someone who walks on the same parcel of the earth in the same cold or the same heat or in the same mild mix. And a man or an animal who can look another man or animal in the eye is his equal. Because they walk on the same fine line, flat from latitude, slaves to the same cold and to the same heat, rich in the same way and in the same way poor. And the only real boundary, no matter how blurry, is between the customer and the salesman, both of whom possess desire and the object of desire empty, full at the same time, with an injustice smaller still than the injustice of being male or female among men or animals. That is why I borrow humility for a time and lend you arrogance. So we won't give the same appearance, which is ineluctably, it's the same for you and for me. So tell me, melancholy virgin, at this moment, when men and animals quietly growl, tell me the thing that you desire and that I can provide you, and I will provide it to you. Almost affectionately, perhaps with affection. And then, after filling the void and flattening the peaks within us, we will walk away one from the other, balanced on the thin and flat rope of our latitude, Satisfied amid men and animals, dissatisfied with being men and dissatisfied with being animals. But don't ask me to guess your desire. In order to satisfy everyone who passes in front of me while I stand here, I would need to enumerate everything in my possession. And no doubt the time required for this enumeration would dry out my heart and wear thin your hope. I don't walk in a certain place at a certain hour. I walk, period, from one point to another for personal business conducted at those points and not along the path between them. I don't know any twilight or any form of desire. And I want to ignore the accidents on my path I was going from that lit window in my back, the back up there, to another lit window, that other one out there in front of me. 
following a very straight line that goes through you because you put yourself there on purpose. And yet there is no way for someone who travels from a high point and to another high point to avoid going down only to have to go back up again with the absurdity of two movements that cancel each other out and at the risk between them of treading on trash thrown out of the windows. The higher one lives, the healthier the air, but the harder the fall. And when the elevator leaves you down here, it condemns you to walk amidst all the things nobody really wanted up there. Piles of rotting memories, like at the restaurant when the waiter brings you the check and enumerates to your disgusted ears all the meals you started digesting a long time ago. You know, the darkness should have been thicker still, so I wouldn't see your face. Only then perhaps I would have misunderstood the reason why you're here, why you moved off your path to place yourself in mine, and why I, in turn, moved off mine to accommodate yours. But what darkness could be so thick to make you look less dark than itself? There is no moonless night that wouldn't look like noon if you walked into it. And that noon makes it clear that it wasn't just the randomness of elevators that brought you down here, but an imprescriptible law of gravity. It was yours alone that you conspicuously carry on your shoulders like a bag that ties you down to this hour and to this place. But you try to assess with a sigh the height of the buildings. As to what I desire, well, if, if there was any desire I could remember down here in this darkness, of the twilight amidst growls of animals that don't ever show their tails. Other than the quite certain desire I have to see you rid yourself of humility and not offer me arrogance. Because if I have a weakness for arrogance, I hate humility in myself and in others. And this exchange, it, it displeases me. What I desire, you certainly wouldn't have. What I desire, if I revealed it to you, would burn your face. It would make you scream and pull your hands away and make you run off like a dog that runs so fast you don't even see its tail. But no, the turmoil of this place and the hour makes me doubt that I ever had any desire to recall. No, no, nor even any offer to make. And uh, you'll have to move away so that I won't have to myself move off my axis. Cancel yourself. Because that light up there at the top of the building, undisturbed, continues to shine despite the approaching darkness. It tears a hole in the darkness like a lit match burning a hole into a piece of rag that tries to snuff it out. You are right to think that I come down from nowhere and have no intention of going up. But you would be wrong to believe that I feel any regret. I steer clear of elevators like a dog steers clear of water. Not that their doors refuse to open for me or that I am repulsed by closing myself in them. But moving elevators tickle me and make me lose my dignity. And if I like to be tickled, I like not to be tickled as soon as my dignity demands it. There are elevators like some drugs. Too much of them makes you float, never going up, never coming down, mistaking curves for straight lines, freezing the fire at its core. That said, during the time that I've spent in this place. I've learned to recognize those flames far away behind the windows that look like frozen like twilights during winter. But if you just approach them gently, perhaps affectionately, 
you'll remember that no glimmer forever remains cold. And my goal is not to put you out, but to shelter you from the wind and to dry up the humidity of the hour with the warmth of this morning. Because, say what you will, the line you walked in, no matter how straight it was, became crooked when you saw me. I grasped the exact moment when you saw me by the exact moment your path became curved. And not curved to get away from me, but curved to come closer to me. Otherwise, we would have never met and you would have gotten further away from me because you were walking with the speed of someone who goes from one point to another. And I would have never caught up with you because I move only slowly, calmly, almost immovably, with the gait of someone who doesn't go from one point to another, but who stays on an invariable spot, lying in wait for whomever passes in front of him and slightly alters his path. And if I say to you that you made a curve, no doubt you will claim that you moved off your path only to avoid me. And then I will claim in turn that you moved only to get closer to me. And surely it is because you never shifted from your path in the first place. And that a line is straight only relative to a plane and that we move on two distinct planes. And in the end, what matters is the fact that you looked at me and that I caught that look or the other way around. And from then, no matter how absolute, the line on which you move became relative and complex, neither straight nor curved, but fateful. Well, in any event, I do not have for your pleasure any illicit desire. My business, I conducted at the accredited hours of daytime in accredited places of business lit by electric light. Maybe I am a whore. If so, my brothel is not of this world. Mine operates under legal light and closes its doors at night, stamped by the law and lit by electric light because even sunlight isn't trustworthy. And it shows complicity. And what do you expect from a man whose every step is accredited and stamped and lawful and flooded with electric light in every corner. And if I am here, mid-course, delayed, suspended, displaced, offside, off life, provisional, practically absent, so to speak, not here. Because do you say of a man traveling across the Atlantic by plane? that he's in Greenland at any given time? And is he really? Or in the tumultuous heart of the ocean? And if I strayed off my path, although the straight line connecting my point of origin to my point of departure had no reason to become crooked all of a sudden, I did so because you blocked my way while being full of illicit intentions and assumptions about me being full of illicit intentions. But know that what I hate most in this world, even more than illicit intentions, even more than the illicit act itself, is the look that someone gives you, assuming that you are full of illicit intentions and so used to them. Not just the look itself. <laughs> So troubling and muddies the torrents of the mountains, and you, your look, rises up the mud at the bottom of a glass of water. But the sheer weight of your gaze violates my virginity. My innocence turned guilty, and the straight line supposed to bring me from one bright point to another bright point got twisted because of you a dark labyrinth and a dark territory where I have lost myself. You're trying to slip a thorn underneath the saddle of my horse so he gets angry and loses control. 
But if my horse is nervous and wild at times, I hold him by a tight bridle so he doesn't lose control so easily. A thorn is no blade, and he knows the thickness of his skin, and he can stand the itch. That said, who can really predict the temper of a horse? Sometimes he can take a needle in his flank. Sometimes a speck of dust under the harness makes him buck. Run in circles. Throw his rider off his back. No, then, if I speak to you at this hour in this way, gently, perhaps still with respect, it is not the way you do. By necessity, your language shows your fear, one that's short and sharp, foolish and flagrant, like a child who is scared of a possible beating from his father. Me, my language belongs to those who don't show themselves. It's the language of this territory in this lapse of time where men pull on their leashes and pigs bang their heads against the fences. Me, I hold my tongue by the bridle like a stallion so he won't jump on the mare because if I let the bridle go, if I slightly distended the pressure of my fingers and the traction of my arms, my horse would throw me off toward the horizon with the violence of an Arab horse who catches the smell of the desert and then nothing can hold him back anymore. That is why, without knowing you, I have treated you correctly from the start. From the first step I took toward you, a correct step, humble and respectful, without knowing if anything in you deserves respect, without knowing anything about you. And if the comparison between our two states allows me to be humble and you arrogant, I let you have arrogance because of the hour of twilight when we approached each other, because at the twilight hour when you approached me, correction is no longer mandatory and it is therefore necessary at this hour when nothing is mandatory anymore except savage encounters in the dark and I could have fallen on you like a piece of rag falling on a candle flame. I could have grabbed you by surprise by the collar of your shirt. And this correction I offered you, however both necessary and arbitrary, binds you to me. If only because I could have stepped on you out of pride like a boot on a dirty paper, because I knew, seeing our respective size, which makes the main difference between us, and at this hour, place only size makes the difference and we both know which one of us is the boot and which the dirty paper if i did so know that i would have desired not to look at you a gaze wanders around sets on random things and believes it is free and neutral territory, like a bee in a field of flowers, like a cow's muzzle in an enclosed pasture. But what can you do with your gaze? Looking at the sky makes me nostalgic. Staring at the ground makes me sad, missing things and remembering that I don't have them, both equally unbearable. So I must look straight ahead at my own eye level no matter what ground I walk on at that moment. That's why a moment ago, when I was walking, where I was walking, and where I have now come to stop, my eyes must have eventually landed on all things lying still or walking at the same level as me, yet because of the laws of distance and perspective, any man or animal is temporarily and approximately at the same level as me. Maybe you're right. The only difference between us, or the only injustice, if you prefer, is that one is vaguely afraid of a possible beating from the other. And the only similarity, or only justice, if you prefer, is the ignorance of the degree of reciprocity of our fear, the degree of the future reality of those beatings and the respective degree 
of their violence. As a result, all we do is duplicate ordinary encounters between men and animals at all hours and in all places that are illicit and dark and invested by no law or electricity. And that's why, out of hatred of animals and out of hatred of men, I choose the law and the electric light. And I am right to think that all natural lights and all non-filtered air and unregulated seasonal temperatures make the world hazardous because there is no peace and no right in the natural elements. There is no business in illicit business, but only threats and escapes and beatings with nothing to buy and nothing to sell and no accepted currency and no price range, only the darkness. The darkness of men who approach each other. <clears throat> and if you approached me, is because in the end, you wanted to strike me. And if I asked you why you wanted to strike me, you would answer, only I know why. And it is for a secret reason you keep to yourself. And there's certainly no need for me to know. So I won't ask you anything. Um, do you talk to a tile that's about to fall from a roof and smash your skull? It's like a bee landing on the wrong flower. Uh, the muzzle of a cow about to graze on the other side of an electric fence. You keep quiet. You run away. You regret. You wait. You do what you can. Senseless motives, illicitness, darkness. I stepped into the stream of a stable where mysteries flow like animal wastes. And those mysteries and this darkness are yours. And they dictate the rule that when two men meet, one must always choose to be the one who strikes first. And without a doubt, at this hour and in these places, one must approach any man or animal who comes in sight, and one must strike first, and then say, I don't know if it was your intention to strike me for some senseless and mysterious reason within the event you wouldn't even deem necessary to share with me. But be that as it may, I preferred to do it first. And my reason, however senseless, at least there's no secret, because of my presence and yours and the accidental meeting of our eyes, I sensed the floating possibility that you might strike me first and I preferred to be the falling tile rather than the skull, the electric fence rather than the cow's muzzle. At, at, at the very least, if it were true that you, the salesman, own merchandise so mysterious that you refuse to show them to me or let me guess what they are, and that I, the buyer, have a desire so secret that even I am not aware of it. And in order for me to see that I have one, I would need to, I would need to scratch my memory like a scab and make it bleed. Uh, if that is true, why do you keep your merchandise to yourself now that I have stopped, now that I am here, now that I am waiting? It's like a a big sealed bag that you carry over your shoulders like an ungraspable law of gravity that wouldn't exist and could only be by conforming to the shape of a desire. Like, like those doormen at the striptease clubs who uh, catch you by the elbow when you go home at night and whisper into your ear, she's here tonight. If you showed them to me, if you gave a name to your offer, licit or illicit goods, but named, and therefore submitted to judgment at the very least, if you named them for me, I would be able to say no. And I would stop feeling like a shaken tree rattled to its roots by an unpredictable wind 
because I know how to say no. And I like saying no. I am able to blow you away with my no. And make you discover all the ways there are to say no, which um, begin with all the ways there are to say yes, like the coquettes, you know, trying to trying on all the dresses and all the shoes, only to buy nothing in the end. And the pleasure they find in trying them on only comes from the pleasure they have in refusing them all. Make up your mind. Show yourself. Are you the brute stumping on the pavement? Or are you a businessman? If so, lay your merchandise out first, and then we'll take the time to look them over. It is because I want to be a businessman and no brute, but a real businessman that I won't tell you what I possess or offer because I cannot suffer a refusal, which is the one thing in the world a businessman dreads most since it is a weapon that he himself does not possess. So I've never learned to say no. I don't want to learn it, but all the kinds of yes, I know them. Yes. Wait a little. Wait a lot. Wait with me in eternity. I have it. I will have it. I had it and will have it again. I never had it, but I will have it for you. And if someone comes and says, let's imagine, I confess to a desire and you have nothing to satisfy it, I will say, I have what it takes to satisfy it. And if someone says, still, imagine that you don't have it. Even while imagining it, I still have it. And if someone says, let's agree that in the end, my desire is so that you absolutely wouldn't even want to have the slightest idea of what it takes to satisfy it. Well, while I wouldn't even want this, despite everything, I have what it takes still. But the more a salesman is decent, the more the buyer is deviant. All a salesman wants is to satisfy a desire he doesn't already know, while the buyer always trades his desire for the primary satisfaction of refusing what is offered to him. His unspoken desire is elated by the refusal, and he gives up on his desire for the pleasure of humiliating the salesman. But I am not the kind of businessman who shows the price tag to satisfy his client's inclination for anger and indignation. I am not here to give pleasure. Instead, I am here to fill the void of desire. To recall. And force it to have a name drag it out to open ground and give it shape and weight, along with the necessary cruelty involved in giving shape and weight to desire. Because I see yours like saliva spilling at the corner of your lips before you swallow it back in, and I'll wait for it to spill out over your chin or wait for you to spit, and only then I will hand you a tissue to wipe yourself clean because if I hand it to you too soon, I know you would refuse it for me. And that is the sort of refusal I don't care to suffer. What every man or every animal dreads at this hour, when men walk at the same level as animals, and when every animal walks at the same level as every man, it isn't the suffering itself because suffering can be measured and his ability to inflict suffering can be measured. What he fears more than anything, it is the strangeness of suffering and being forced to endure a suffering that is unfamiliar to him. And so the distance that will always keep brutes away from the young ladies who populate the world does not come from the respective assessment of their strengths. Because then 
the world will simply be divided between brutes and young ladies. And every brute would jump on every young lady and the world would be simple. But what keeps the brute away from the young lady and will keep him away for eternity is the infinite mystery and the infinite strangeness of the weapons. Like those little spray bottles that young ladies keep in their purses that project liquid in the eyes of the brutes and make them cry. And suddenly brutes are crying in front of young ladies. All dignity vanished. No longer man or animal turned into nothing. Only tears of shame shed over a field. That's why brutes and young ladies fear each other and are squarely and equally wary of each other because we only inflict the suffering we can endure ourselves. And we only fear suffering that we can't inflict ourselves on others. So don't hold back. Go ahead. Tell me. The object of your fever, of your gaze upon me, the reason. And if it is a matter of not wounding your pride, then say it like you would to a tree or in front of a prison wall or in the solitude of a cotton field where you walk naked at night. Tell it to me without even looking at me. Because the only real cruelty of this twilight hour where we stand is not that one man wounds the other, maims him, tortures him, severs his limbs and his head, or even makes him cry. The true and terrible cruelty is the cruelty of a man or animal who makes another man or animal incomplete, who interrupts him like an ellipsis in the middle of a sentence, who turns away despite setting his eyes on him who turns the animal or the man into an error of his gaze, an error of his judgment, an error like a letter you started but crumple into a ball right after writing the date. God in the world, what you got? Smith Apocalypse. <laughs> Okay. So, um, uh, wow, we, we, we do many readings here, but I have to say this was a great one. Another round of applause, really. <laughs> Oh, wow. First of all, again, thank you for Philippe for flying in from Paris. He could make it happen uh, and combine it for Ismail to fly in from Atalanta. Um, thank you thank for you. doing this. So the, the idea can be done. I also want to acknowledge Jim Fletcher is here in the audience. So thank you for coming. Um, and um, and uh, maybe um, let's... Uh, Let's start off. Maybe we have a few comments from the audience. Two or three. Uh, who has a reaction or want to say something? Uh, yes, of oh, course. Are, um, my name is Nicole Berman Bloom. Uh, I used to work with the uh, Villa Albertine French Cultural Services, so I've seen um, the the approach, the cultess approach, uh, year after year with. Um, Marion, you, uh, I mean, 
Uh, and yes, I have one question. I have many questions uh, as usual. Um, and one is for Amin for the first, uh, for the night. The word, the word brother, is it kamerad? It is. Okay. Can you it speak is. of the choice of brother versus kamerad? Absolutely. Uh, thank you for this question. Um, there are many, many challenges to um, translating La Nuit. Of course, the rhythm, the musicality. But there is one somewhat classical challenge with this text, which is the period where it comes from and where I, we, I translate it for, which is for American audiences in American language. Uh, especially, it was originally translated in Atlanta, Georgia um, for, that, for Ismail. Um, the transition between camar the, the value of the word camarade in La Nuit Juste Avant la Forêt, the night just before the forest, is one of bonding. It's of one of bonding within the context of syndicat unions in the com communism period. In the, uh, there, there, was, there was a very strong communist culture life there. And um, translating that word as camarade, camarade here in the 21st century, mm. US has a highly different value, mm. highly different value. The word brother, translates uh, translates that bonds quite a bit here in the US, but it also has a, um, a very special um, meaning in Cortez's corpus in itself, which is, it describes exactly what Camara does in that text, which is a bond between two people, but that bond at the same time is a threat of violence. And mm -hmm. fraternité is a very specific kind of word, has a specific meaning in Cortez. That's why I applied it here. Maybe two, one, two more comments or, yeah. Okay. Hi there, my name is Wesley. Uh, my question is, I'm not sure who this is uh, best directed towards, but uh, the play has a very, how to put it, high literary register, uh, very, the, the rhythms, the uh, repetitions, they're all over. Uh, my question is, about grounding the work within a reality. How do you start to piece that together? Because it's clear that we're dealing with, at the same time, real people and also very abstract circumstances. So how do you ground this dialogue into a uh, motivated reality? Maybe to Philippe? Okay, I'm going to try to answer, but uh, my English is not so good. But I, I, I do my best. It's a very good. It's a very good and very difficult question. <laughs> uh, from my experience, it seems that um, maybe we are wrong when we are doing separation between reality and ideas. I mean, in acting and as well in directing, with display writer, because. Each word is a body. So it means it's something very concrete and very real. In fact, even the ideas can be real. Even when the people, the, the dealer or the client, don't speak, they are still real in the listening, in the silence. You know, we used to speak very often about the silence in the Chekhov plays. I never heard anybody speaking about the sciences about Cortes. Never. But this is not monologue. It's a real and pure dialogue. So we have to listen at the peop the character who doesn't speak. And if we think about that, it means ideas and concrete situation. What is a situation? A situation is when you have a conflict. Not we don't have any situation, and they are all the time in conflict. So, it, it, what does it mean? It means that we don't have to think about that. We have to believe, to trust it, what is said. And when we read the text, it seems very complex. But if we don't forget that it's for speaking, for the it's like an oral tradition 
It's like a gospel. When you read the gospel, it's, it's very poor. But when we hear the gospel, suddenly it's very powerful. It's like a prayer, you know? So it's, I, I, I try to answer you, but I think we don't have to think as we are used to think in acting. Anyone else? I want to hear what Ishmael says about being grounded because he's so grounded in this language. <clears throat> I think um, yes, I think I have my I think my mic's still on. Yeah. Is it okay? Yeah. Um, I think a part of it is uh, one large part is that. So I I try to strip away any sort of artifice. And what I mean by that, this isn't too, I don't know, archetypes. This isn't two characters and it's like a sitcom turning on Law and Order and you're like, dun, 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 just the facts. And it's just, it's, it's, it's really, it's what you saw tonight is it's really me and Tony going at one another in the best way we can. I just met him recently and so, this is our, you got to witness our violent reaction, our violent interaction with one another in real time. He says things and it's, it's, it's hilarious or he says things that, that make me think with, even within the, the, the language of the text. And so I don't, we don't have to, we're, we're, we're grounded because that's what it is. All this thing is about the desire and about the deal. And, but the deal is, whether it's to God or, <laughs> or whether it's to the insect, it's all we do is a deal. We have the deal. I have the deal. I'm the, I'm the dealer to you right now as the client. And I'm trying to get you to tell me what your desire is so I can try to fulfill the desire. And so if it's that, then you don't have any choice but to be grounded in something because I'm not trying to become someone else. And I'm not trying to portray or demonstrate a thing. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, so it's it's always I don't know like real stakes in that way, and something that are where it's given circumstances, but the circumstances in that way is 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 always real because we're always dealing, I guess. Yeah, Tony, uh, to your question. Um, you, we know you from your work with Richard Foreman, Reza Abdu, and the great New York theater artist. Well, how did it feel for you? How did how well, did you experience the I'm text? kind of like I'm I'm kind of like the junior member of this group in terms of my relationship with Coltez. I'm actually the person who introduced me to, with to Coltez. It's interesting. It's Dan Rutherberg over there. We were working on um, Super Training about five years ago, which was a piece without text. One day, just as a change of pace, he said, "Why don't you guys read this?" It kind of blew my mind. So um, it's kind of exciting to uh, get another chance to wrestle with material. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like, yeah, it's when you look at the pages, you look at the chunks of text and they're incredibly long arias of language. And it seems to be a argument about abstract things. But when actually doing it and and working with Ishmael and working with the writer and director here of this of this version, it really boils down to really, really simple relationship conflict. So it really, for me, it was, it felt very, very easy to ground it in um, all the stuff you, an actor just wants out of a text to be able to activate that conflict. So um, it's, you know, and the fascinating thing was what uh, Philippe was talking about was the silences, because what I felt that every time, even when, every time I spoke, I was like trying to peacock myself up, trying to give myself strength to like rule this encounter. But every time I was listening, I felt like my character was l completely giving himself over to the other. And so that push and pull between losing myself and then trying to regain myself when I was back in sort of the driver's seat of having the language was for me just an extremely exciting place to be as an actor. So. You know, it's not just literary thing. It's like there are motors within the language that are really, really useful for the actor. Hmm. 
Can I add, add just something about the question of Nicole? Because I think it was a very good um, comment, une pique d'un toréador sur le, le taureau. Because uh, uh, for, my, from, for, for me, as a French, when I'm coming here in the in, in US, the difference between camarade and brothers is like a feedback about something we, which is course, differently from this side of the, the ocean compared to Europe. And it's about, it's difficult to explain, but in, let's say, I will try to remember, to, to resume. In Europe, we have, a, let's say, like something like an impensé social, an unthinking, so, a social unthinking. Is it, is it, is it, something like this, which is very close to the unthinking, the, uh, the racial unthinking, uh, l'impensé racial. And we never question that, the articulation between these two big topics in history. C'est très récent. It's very recent. And I think here it's different. So the, it's because these, the people in America have begun before something that we didn't do in Europe, that, I mean, have the space to use the, the word border. You follow me, Nicole? It's... Let's, 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 let's go. Because, because we're in New York, in the US, and... Um, so especially in, in the solitude, um, how does race suddenly resonate here among the audience? Um, and it's something that suddenly was a little bit new for me now in 2023, which was not when I so the first, uh, the first time was, uh, in fact, in the eighties, uh, the Patrice Chéreau uh, staging. Um, so what Marion did also, and uh, another one uh, for women, solitude with between two women. Um, so, so it's a question for for you all and for Amin, who translated uh, about race specifically in solitude, and also this uh, resonance of the cotton field. Um, there, there's a big context behind the notion of race in solitude in particular, because that's the play that um, made Voltaire's break up with Chéreau. Break up with Chéreau. Um, because uh, the first two, uh, two, uh, two times that Chéreau uh, staged solitude, the dealer was Chef was a very famous, important yeah. European director in France who was they were he, he was he, he basically um introduced Coltes to the world. Yeah. And and he was very faithful to Chero, but Coltes was very upset when uh he chose uh a white person, uh as in himself, Chero actually was himself playing the, the dealer, uh to play the dealer. And the reason was that uh Coltes wanted him to be black. There's a line that you all heard uh, that the client says that if you walk into a night, the night would look like, like a noon. And that's the hint that the client and the dealer is black. But Chéreau, like Jean Genet, uh, uh, Chéreau, I'm sorry, Coltes, like Jean Genet, Coltes says that, you know, all in, in the audience, whatever, the, whatever play I write, there should always be one black person. Uh, and even if there's no black person, they should make a dummy black and put it there because it's addressed to uh, to the minorities. It's addressed to the minorities. So he talks a lot about the blood of the Arab people, of the black people of France, and that's the new blood that makes the new France. And it, it is true that the third production of Chéreau that made Solitude very famous, in which he himself played the dealer, uh, he put the accent on the homo, 
eroticism between the characters, and it was it was a beautiful play, but it certainly most certainly was not faithful to the at least intention of original intention of Plotus. The subject kind of veered off, but I wanted to say, Ismail, really I loved, um, I, I think the topic came up that you have this sort of neutrality in your delivery, which I thought was brilliant because the words are so strong and powerful and um, you know, the way you just, you know, said the words with your intention to get, you know, to convince your counterpart. And I just thought it was very powerful and a really beautiful choice. And I'm not, I'm not an actor, but I'm, you know, just out of curiosity, when you um, read the script, do you eventually develop a personality? Because do you inject your own, you know, because we're not neutral, right? So your, your personality, does it go into this darkness that you represent or how do you work with it? Hmm. Well, uh, it is certainly, I'm all things at once. And what I mean by that is that I, th there's what is beautiful about me. And there is what is ugly about me, what is virtuous about me. And what is vile and, and, you know, about me. I'm all of it at once and I don't it's in I I embrace it in fact uh so that I can I don't know to, to try to realize who I am as the sort of acme of my of my humanity or my evolution and so it's it's it, but furthermore to that point it's like I, I for me it's like while well, I'm wearing this t-shirt of uh of Christopher Wallace of the of notorious B.I.G. Uh, while, I, while I'm at my friend's house uh, in, in Brooklyn. Is Brooklyn in the house? <laughs> and so it's, it's all I can hear when doing Cortez and doing work uh, that, is, that is musical like this. All I can hear is that sort of language. So when I hear, you know, you were turning the street corner when I saw you, when I hear if you walk outside at this hour and in this place, what what I truly hear is uh, 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 your talk is senseless. Actor, ni chiropractor for crack jaw. Yes, I rock your chatterbox. Dangerous, you're not. I guess down, twist your body round and round, upside down. And it's the same thing. And so we want to elevate theater like Shakespeare and and, and, and but Cortez in this instance and elevate it and be like, no, it's it's uh, and we speak about it like this. And it's just like, and it's not that, in fact. Especially Cortez is in the gutter, like like Biggie, and so it's 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 that musicality. There's a, it's arrows. Zoom. All we did were arrows at one another. Loads the arrow up. That's why I love when he's like, you know, that the, you stir up mud in the bottom of a glass of water, and I walk in and I walk in the darkness, and you make you make darkness look like high noon. And I have to stifle laughs because that's <laughs> fucking funny. Also, and this is another thing about it, is this 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 notion of uh this is this is this is it's highly comedic. And I have to fight the urge to make it uh and it's rot and everything is serious and heavy. And it's just like, oh if that is funny to say these sorts of things, that's that's hilarious. You stir mud up at the bottom of a glass of water. That is funny. So a long way around to answer your 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 forward question, but it's yeah, it's 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 that. Um, um, thank you. Thank you. I mean, tell us a little bit about Cortez and New York. How long do we have? Uh, <laughs> yeah, Cortez discovered New York when uh, he was first traveling to. Quebec, when he was 20, he just spent a few hours transiting, and he was just shocked. And he says that he didn't have time to discover Paris. He just went straight to New York. And he went to Quebec, and he hitchhiked all the way back to New York just to see it again. And then he writes in his letters that, you know, New York where, is where he belongs. And that's the place where he will always come back. And the reason is um, that's 
I have so many quotes in my head. The, he describes New York as being the bag, a bag where they put everybody who doesn't belong anywhere. <laughs> and uh, he himself most certainly didn't belong, didn't feel like belonging in France. He had a deep hatred, really, uh, for his um, country of origin, but also town of origin, which was uh, on the north east uh, mess in Lorraine part that was in his childhood. Um, the French military bombed Arab cafes during the Algerian wars. He was just disgusted, he fled. He keeps repeating that New York uh, is very unique in that sense, in that sense of diversity. But then there's also, of course, the uh, he was in New York at the moment of the gay liberation movement. He participated uh, not proactively, I must say. He didn't uh, proactively participate, but he was among the, um, uh, those, those people on the piers, on the West Piers, abandoned West Piers are very close to um, Tony's house back then, um, where the gay population thrived. Really, and he thrived in his letters. He says uh, the Peter Rabbit was 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 a gay bar. He says I prefer it to my bed. I prefer it to my mother's belly. Um, so these, the second priest in the solitude of a cotton field, and West Pier. Um, that's Marion right here. Um, also, also stay uh, translated. Um, these are two place inspired by New York. He says that New York is the place for writing theater because of those improbable encounters like we saw in Solitude. It's those encounters between people that are incompatible with each other, but that improbability, incompatibility makes something happen. That doesn't happen in the homogeneity, for example, of France. Um, He's, but then he also says that he doesn't have many good things to say about American theater back then, at least. That's, you know, um, New York is the place for writing theater, but not for playing, making theater, at least his theater. Um, so, yes, New York is the place where he feels solitude being in crowds. You know, Jeunet famously said that solitude in prison was the condition for writing for him, he says that solitude, uh, Cortez's solitude in crowds is the place for me to write. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if whoever of you knows Robert Lyons from the Ohio Theater, Cortez, I think, lived for a while in his apartment. Um, so there's a very strong connection. Ed Koch is a character um, in one of his plays. Um, so there's a very strong connection. Before we come to some more questions, um, do those play work, let's say, Tomorrow, someone puts them up. What do you feel? What, um, well, as an honest, is that does it capture something still? Um, how old are the plays? So uh, the night just before the fourth is seventy-seven, and uh, Solitude is eighty-six. So forty years plus. What do you all think? I'm gonna try to be very uh, factual. Factual. Uh, very often I heard people working in theater, they say, no, no, it's over, now call this. And if you ask them some question, you can see that they didn't read them. So it's as usual, you know, in a way. Because for me, it's not a surprise. Um, but um, I recall, I, I made um, three times in, in the solitude, Two in France, one in Portugal. I made uh, two times um, the night. One, the second one with you, Ismail, in Atlanta and Metz, and the other one in Ankara. I made Black Battle with Dogs in Salvador, in Brazil. Uh, now I'm in New York. What I mean is that it's very strange because, as usual, French people doesn't recognize What's happening in when some somebody asks Jeunet, it's the same with uh, Cortes, 
it doesn't matter because all the other countries get him and continue to get him. You know, la, le, le, the, the best ones in France is the, they are not recognized very often, or it takes much more long time. To, and we forget it, we, we are very, on est pressé de les oublier. The French people are hurrying to forget about those important figures. I, I, I tell you the truth. Oh, well, I mean, I can't, I'm in, I can't make a value judgment from the outside. Inside, it was one of the most thrilling experiences I've had in a while to do this text with Ishmael. So, like, for me, yeah, sure. <laughs> Bring it, please. I think and, it is. Uh, you know, being in New York, but we were talking about the fact that at the heart, there is a sort of, I said, well, this, you know, there is a sort of, possibility that the unspoken of desire is specifically sexual and i was talking about when i worked with reza abdo an artist who i feel has some sort of energetic relationships with cultez and um uh back when we were working on father was a peculiar man in the meatpacking district in 1990 that's back when these peers were still there they've all the sites of all these cruising areas where Coltez was inspired to write this play have all been destroyed. But it's, you know, the history is still there. And, uh, you know, uh, that wasn't my scene, but it was something that I was aware of. And I was aware of the spaces and the fact that these mysterious meetings were happening in there, mm -hmm. even as a, as a child, as a young child playing on the high line as a like 15 year old back when it was just a wild space. So for me specifically now as a New Yorker, I feel the um, that energy, that history of New York being very much part of this play. So I'm interested as a New Yorker in this play in the context of its uh, inspiration from uh, that vanished world that's still very much kind of spiritually there, spiritually present. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because I think in fact, <sighs> So for me, a lot of these, a lot of Coltes is about sensuality, which includes sexuality, but it, but absolutely sensuality, and it's about being inside one's body, truly inhabiting one's body, and a lot of times in. Uh, so, as an actor, it's like the French actors I come across just as a as a general rule. <laughs> The French actors that I come across is like, so they're here and they have a rich concentration on language and it's beautiful, but they are absolutely not in their bodies. American actors, it's not here. Uh, uh, they're in their bodies, but even that is sort of a, uh, not really. We give a show about being in our bodies and Everything's big and bad and we're all over the place. And people, I think we sort of mistake that sort of thing for like once being grounded. And this is, come, you know, taking workshops from Maureen Fleming and have her just destroy me because I'm absolutely not in my body. And so it's, 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 Colt has addresses all that, all this stuff about the sensuality and putting us up the face, making us face that notion of 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 raw sensuality of 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 what it is to desire. Uh, I was about to say love, but he, he it's not even about love. He says all the time that there is no love, there is no love. Uh, but about desire, I'm really fascinated about this thing of desire. And for for those of us who are like the desires wide open for everyone to see. Uh, like an open book, and for those of us who are more reserved, and it's like, no, I don't do those sorts of things, or I don't feel those certain things, or I don't say that certain thing, and it's just like I'm that collision. It's like I'm vastly, it's like because I'm I'm trying to be. I'm not saying I've <laughs> reached the, the 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 acme of it, but I'm I'm wide fucking open to do anything. Of course I am. I have to be. It's like, a, not as an actor, but as a human being. 
Otherwise, it's just like, oh, God, I'm not in my body. I'm not alive in that way. And maybe two, three more things. One, two, and a third. Third there. Yeah. So. <clears throat> Thank you for, for acknowledging. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. It's to be a recording. It was how long? Just introduce yourself. Thank you for acknowledging that, by the way. Um, and I think you've all touched on how visceral this work is on every plane. I was going to share thanks to Frank. France and the United States preserve their catalog in very different ways. But they have the same thing at stake. Um, they also fund culture in different ways. So. What is the role of the translator, the director, and the players in preserving the work, do you think? Um, just quickly, as, as the translator answering your question, um, I think that's the uh, relationship of the translator with Cortes is the same of the that Ismail was describing from the actor to to Cortes is that I I'm not a translator I translate Cortes I don't translate for the sake of it and the reason for that is that I have a I feel because of my background and we were all talking about our childhoods and how coming from very different places we meet at the same place through Cortes. It's a very intimate relationship. Um, and, and the Cortes community, and I know it quite well throughout the world, is a very tight one because we all see it and we all feel it. And it's really a labor of love beyond archive and beyond scholarship, although you know, the book <laughs> that we made is supposed to help scholarship, is supposed, is supposed to kind of launch a new movement. But that all comes from that passion, really, of love. Um, that's really what I wanted to say, yeah. No, I was thinking that um, when you came from uh, uh, Iran, you were in Thionville. Thionville is 35 kilometers from the native city of Cortes. I was born in Metz, the native city of Cortes. And um, I decided to do theater because my, my mo mother had a picture of Angela Davis, you know? Mm -hmm. She was an uh, activist to get free Angela Davis in 68. And I was one year old, and I was on her arm. So I, for me, um, Africa meant a lot, and for Cortes as well. His father was uh, in the army during the colonial war. And uh, I think this historical past, when you are living in East of France, when Amin said at the beginning, when he introduced the play writer, saying that it was a military city, when military uh, family were, you have to imagine what does it mean for the body. Mm -hmm. And it makes the link with what Ismail said. Um, in Black Battle with Dog, Alboway, he's looking for the body of her brother. Her brother. So for all that reasons that we maybe you are not all the time conscious of that, but it's there, it's my part, it's my history as well. For that reason, I'm in that team. They are friends. They are real friends. I know Tony since last week. And she, he's my real friend. I know him since um, 15 years 
I know his face since 12 years. And we are very linked, you know? It's a team, it's like jazz player. Translator, directing, actors, yes, but doing something like jazz players. And how long have you been working with Cortez in Atlanta? Uh, since 2000. Yeah. Uh, with working with, uh, I was introduced to it by a uh, French director at the uh, Théâtre National Bretagne. His name is uh, Artur Nassiziev. And uh, that's how I was introduced into, Colt with, uh, into Coltes's world. And then um, uh, uh, in 2006, I was doing Black Battles with Dogs at uh, Festival d'Avignon. And that's how I met Nicole. And was just sitting around the table uh said i got this idea i'm gonna go up to, to paris meet francois i want to translate just one play i want to do it in the metro station in atlanta and all the stuff went up there uh, but before i went up we were having dinner and nicole said i can help you with this thing i just met her that evening <laughs> yes next question sure thank you uh hi uh, my name is Kay. I'm a student at the Graduate Center uh, and have enjoyed taking classes with uh, Amin. Um, and I was really thrilled by your remark about uh, the sensuality of Coltes. And I wondered about the connection that that might have in all of your experiences also with the concept we've already touched on of the orality uh, of both the piece and of theater as a necessarily aural it must be heard. It's about the pleasure of hearing things in certain ways. And so I was wondering, on your end as the translator, were there certain killed darlings you had to make in the pleasurable sounds that were in the French? Or were there things that you were especially pleased with in your translation into English for the sound? Um, and for you both getting to, you know, speak it and and embody it, were there things that were especially moving in the language um, for that kind of aesthetic or sensual nature? Um, so thank you for the question, nice seeing you again. Um, I believe that uh, actors can speak to this as a translator, and as, as, as a writer, uh, because again, Coltes himself was a translator and he said that he learned writing through translating and that's why I started translating. It really, uh, you enter the sens sensuality of the text through the rhythm and the musicality of it. And he actually speaks of it, but especially he, when he speaks about translation, but also writing itself, that there's a, there's a very clear difference between, you know, signification of words and the relationship of words in their musicality. And that what he wants and what he looks for is that musicality that really kind of awakes something in the body. And uh, Ismail was, you know, the, throwing the arches and the arrows, and that's the rhythm. And it's very physical. It's very physical, and it gives you chill when you watch them do it. It gives me chill just by reading it. It gives me an enormous physical pleasure just translating this because he translates the sens sensuality and the, uh, into the rhythm and the musicality of those texts. And he has very specific method, a method. He has a method for doing this. And as long as you actually read him a lot and understand how he works and how he writes, uh, you understand, yeah, it makes sense. And it's a very signature style. It's a very signature style. I can talk about this in details, which I probably don't think we have the time. And we don't have the time. But, uh, but I think that, yeah, the sensuality is absolutely there and comes first in through the rhythm and the musicality. Mm -hmm. Anybody wants to? Well, maybe we go to last question before we have a little reception, you know? So here we go. Uh, my name is Lily. And uh, my question is, um, who is... Um, who is the audience uh, for Solitude? Who is this meant for? It's a half an hour play, so it cannot be like in a commercial theater, cannot be on Broadway or Broadway. We only did not half long an hour excerpt. I, I see, but how long is the play then? Oh, and 20 minutes. Yeah, about, about an hour. 
so our 20 minutes. How uh, the question is for uh, director, you said the, you directed it in three countries. How many runs each time it was? How many performances? And was it the sold out house? Who is going to see this? Uh, who is gonna pay the money and then walk out and then be impressed and keep thinking about the play? Because to me, like the great work of art, if I go see a play or an opera or I'm going to listen to a symphony and if I cannot fall asleep at night, it means it made an effect on me. And for this play, I think it's so important the acting, obviously, and was superb acting today. But tell me, who goes to the, those the plays? Um, I remember it was all the time sold out. Um, uh, and I so the public I I met was French, Turkish, Portuguese, Mozambique, Brazilian with display, and there were. They were quite removed. Um, uh, I'm I'm used to to work with for public for audience who don't go. Don't we are, we are not used to go to the theater. For example, when we did in the solitude, I did as well Tabataba, and Tabataba. If I made it, it was to go outside of the theater, in the popular area of the cities, in favelas, for example, in Brazil, or in Saint-Saint-Denis, in the, you know, the suburbs uh, in, in Paris, the night tree, you know, that kind of territories. And it was the same. Uh, when we did it in Kinshasa, in Congo, it, it, the people got, get, get it. Even the people didn't speak French because I just uh, speak Lingala, but I got the situation, you know? So I think we can play Cortez everywhere. In... I'm sure it's different in every country. I think we're gonna, we have to come to an end and you can maybe ask and the party, how many and how much the ticket costs. Um, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> maybe just as the very last, what are you guys working on in a very few sentences? We start with you, um, what, what, what are your, pro project at the moment, what are you doing? Yeah. Yeah, personal, what, your new work project. Okay, yes. Um, well, I just finished my academic book, which is a big relief. Now I-, I Book uh, on? Okay, yes, it's on the, uh, theory and um, the theory of theater and psychology, a psychoanalytic theory and a lot of post- Very boring, boring, yes. Uh, dramatic. More, more exciting project that I have is with Philippe. Uh, he's uh, working on staging one of my plays, one of my new plays. That is very much, very, very, very much inspired by Cortes himself. Uh, Cortes taught me so much, and that's um, I, I, he just taught me to love writing, so that's it. Uh, I'll give you the microphone. Oh, yeah, my, my, my. Oh, yes, uh, so, um, at the Prelude Festival in the fall, I did a uh, work in progress of uh, Spider Rabbit, Margot McClure text, a solo piece that I did with uh, my longtime collaborator, the director Dan Safer. We're looking to continue with that, and I would like to continue working on this. Thank you very much. I would like to continue to work with this team here in New York, in Atlanta, and in other countries in America. Please. <laughs> Any projects in Europe? I'm working on my first uh, uh, novel. I just finally just got my uh, got an agent. So I'm working on my first novel. It's a coming of age story, loosely based on uh, uh, on my life, but instead of from my perspective, from uh, all the people involved in my life, even uh, peripherally, and how they observe me. So it's uh, so I'm working on that right now. Amazing, and thank you all for coming. Did you? What? Tony Sarah, yeah. Dan Safer, he directed Roberto Zucco by Cortez in 2000. That's, well, that's correct. correct. Yeah. Okay, that's so correct. a big applause. Thank you to everybody, and thank you for coming and stay for a little reception. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks to our viewers in HowlRound and to our HowlRound, VJ and Emily. Thank you.